Chapter 4 The next morning Paris was wrapped in one of the dense fogs that throw the most punctual people out in their calculations as to the time. Even the most business-like folk fail to keep their appointments in such weather, and ordinary mortals wake up at noon and fancy it is eight o'clock. On this morning it was half-past nine, and Madame Vauquer still lay abed. Christophe was late, Sylvie was late, but the two sat comfortably taking their coffee as usual. It was Sylvie's custom to take the cream off the milk destined for the boarder's breakfast for her own, and to boil the remainder for some time, so that Madame should not discover this illegal exaction. "'Sylvie,' said Christophe, as he dipped a piece of toast into the coffee, "'Monsieur Vautrin, who is not such a bad sort all the same, had two people come to see him again last night. If Madame says anything, mind you say nothing about it.' has he given you something he gave me a five-franc piece this month which is as good as saying hold your tongue except him and madame couture who doesn't look twice at every penny there's no one in the house that doesn't try to get back with the left hand all that they give you with the right at new year said sylvie and after all said christophe what do they give you a miserable five-franc piece there is father goriot who has cleaned his shoes himself these two years past there is that old beggar poiret who goes without blacking altogether he would sooner drink it than put it on his boots then there is that whippersnapper of a student who gives me a couple of francs two francs will not pay for my brushes and he sells his old clothes and gets more for them than they are worth oh they're a shabby lot pooh said sylvie sipping her coffee our places are the best in the quarter that i know but about that great big chap vautrin christophe has any one told you anything about him yes i met a gentleman in the street a few days ago he said to me there's a gentleman in your place isn't there a tall man that dyes his whiskers i told him no sir they aren't dyed a gay fellow like him hasn't the time to do it and when i told m vautrin about it afterwards he said quite right my boy that is the way to answer them there is nothing more unpleasant than to have your little weaknesses known it might spoil many a match well and for my part said sylvie a man tried to humbug me at the market wanting to know if i had seen him put on his shirt such bosh there she cried interrupting herself that's a quarter to ten striking at the val de grace and not a soul stirring pooh they're all gone out madame couture and the girl went out at eight o'clock to take the wafer at saint etienne father goriot started off somewhere with a parcel and the student won't be back from his lecture till ten o'clock i saw them go while i was sweeping the stairs father goriot knocked up against me and his parcel was as hard as iron what is the old fellow up to i wonder he is as good as a plaything for the rest of them they can never let him alone but he is a good man all the same and worth more than all of them put together he doesn't give you much himself but he sometimes sends you with a message to ladies who fork out famous tips they are dressed grandly too his daughters as he calls them eh there are a dozen of them i have never been to more than two the two who came here there is madame moving overhead i shall have to go or she will raise a fine racket just keep an eye on the milk christophe don't let the cat get at it sylvie went up to her mistress's room sylvie how is this it's nearly ten o'clock and you let me sleep like a dormouse such a thing has never happened before it's the fog it is that thick you could cut it with a knife but how about breakfast ah the boarders are possessed i'm sure they all cleared out before there was a wink of daylight do speak properly sylvie madame vauquer retorted say a blink of daylight ah oh, well madame whichever you please anyhow you can have breakfast at ten o'clock la michonnette and poiret have neither of them stirred there are only those two upstairs and they are sleeping like the logs they are but sylvie you put their names together as if as if what said sylvie bursting into a guffaw the two of them make a pair 
it is a strange thing isn't it sylvie how monsieur vautrin got in last night after christophe had bolted the door not at all madame christophe heard monsieur vautrin and went down and undid the door and here are you imagining that give me my bodice and be quick and get breakfast ready dish up the rest of the mutton with the potatoes and you can put the stewed pears on the table those at five a penny a few moments later madame vauquer came down just in time to see the cat knock down a plate that covered a bowl of milk and begin to lap in all haste mistigree she cried the cat fled but promptly returned to rub against her ankles oh yes you can wheedle you old hypocrite she said sylvie sylvie yes madame what is it just see what the cat has done it is all that stupid christophe's fault i told him to stop and lay the table what has become of him don't you worry madame father goriot shall have it i will fill it up with water and he won't know the difference he never notices anything not even what he eats i wonder where the old heathen can have gone said madame vauquer setting the plates round the table who knows he is up to all sorts of tricks i have overslept myself said madame vauquer but madame looks as fresh as a rose all the same the doorbell rang at that moment and vautrin came through the sitting-room singing loudly tis the same old story everywhere a roving heart and a roving glance oh mamma vauquer good morning he cried at the sight of his hostess and he put his arm gaily round her waist there have done impertinence say it he answered come say it now isn't that what you really mean stop a bit i will help you to set the table ah i am a nice man am i not for the locks of brown and the golden hair a sighing lover oh i have just seen something so funny led by chance what asked the widow father goriot in the goldsmith's shop in the rue dauphine at half-past eight this morning they buy old spoons and forks and gold lace there and goriot sold a piece of silver plate for a good round sum it had been twisted out of shape very neatly for a man that's not used to the trade really you don't say so yes one of my friends is expatriating himself i had been to see him off on board the royal mail steamer and was coming back here i waited after that to see what father goriot would do it is a comical affair he came back to this quarter of the world to the rue des Grès, and went into a money-lender's house everybody knows him gobseck a stuck-up rascal that would make dominoes out of his father's bones a turk a heathen an old jew a greek it would be a difficult matter to rob him for he puts all his coin into the bank then what was father goriot doing there doing said vautrin nothing he was bent on his own undoing he is a simpleton stupid enough to ruin himself by running after there he is cried sylvie christophe cried father goriot's voice come upstairs with me christophe went up and shortly afterwards came down again where are you going madame vauquer asked of her servant out on an errand for monsieur goriot what may that be said vautrin pouncing on a letter in christophe's hand madame la comtesse anastasie de restaud he read where are you going with it he added as he gave the letter back to christophe to the rue du helder i have orders to give this into her hands myself what is there inside it said vautrin holding the letter up to the light a banknote no he peered into the envelope a receipted account he cried my word tis a gallant old dotard off with you old chap he said bringing down a hand on christophe's head and spinning the man round like a thimble you will have a famous tip by this time the table was set sylvie was boiling the milk madame vauquer was lighting a fire in the stove with some assistance from vautrin who kept humming to himself the same old story everywhere a roving heart and a roving glance when everything was ready madame couture and madame taillefer came in 
where have you been this morning fair lady said madame vauquer turning to madame couture we have just been to say our prayers at saint etienne du mont to-day is the day when we must go to see monsieur taillefer poor little thing she is trembling like a leaf madame couture went on as she seated herself before the fire and held the steaming soles of her boots to the blaze warm yourself victorine said madame vauquer it is quite right and proper mademoiselle to pray to heaven to soften your father's heart said vautrin as he drew a chair nearer to the orphan girl but that is not enough what you want is a friend who will give the monster a piece of his mind a barbarian that has three millions so they say and will not give you a dowry and a pretty girl needs a dowry nowadays poor child said madame vauquer never mind my pet your wretch of a father is going just the way to bring trouble upon himself victorine's eyes filled with tears at the words and the widow checked herself at a sign from madame couture if we could only see him said the commissary-general's widow if i could speak to him myself and give him his wife's last letter i have never dared to run the risk of sending it by post he knew my handwriting o oh, woman persecuted and injured innocent exclaimed vautrin breaking in upon her so that is how you are is it in a few days time i will look into your affairs and it will be all right you shall see oh sir said victorine with a tearful but eager glance at vautrin who showed no sign of being touched by it if you know of any way of communicating with my father please be sure and tell him that his affection and my mother's honour are more to me than all the money in the world if you can induce him to relent a little towards me i will pray to god for you you may be sure of my gratitude the same old story everywhere sang vautrin with a satirical intonation at this juncture goriot mademoiselle michonneau and poiret came downstairs together possibly the scent of the gravy which sylvie was making to serve with the mutton had announced breakfast the seven people thus assembled bade each other good morning and took their places at the table the clock struck ten and the student's footstep was heard outside ah here you are monsieur eugene said sylvie every one is breakfasting at home to-day the student exchanged greetings with the lodgers and sat down beside goriot i have just met with a queer adventure he said as he helped himself abundantly to the mutton and cut a slice of bread which madame vauquer's eyes gauged as usual an adventure queried poiret well and what is there to astonish you in that old boy vautrin asked of poiret monsieur eugene is cut out for that sort of thing mademoiselle taillefer stole a timid glance at the young student tell us about your adventure demanded monsieur vautrin yesterday evening i went to a ball given by a cousin of mine the vicomtesse de beauseant she has a magnificent house the rooms are hung with silk in short it was a splendid affair and i was as happy as a king fisher put in vautrin interrupting what do you mean sir said eugene sharply i said fisher because king fishers see a good deal more fun than kings quite true i would much rather be the little careless bird than a king said poiret the dittoist because in fact the law student cut him short i danced with one of the handsomest women in the room a charming countess the most exquisite creature i have ever seen there was peach blossom in her hair and she had the loveliest bouquet of flowers real flowers that scented the air but there it is no use trying to describe a woman glowing with the dance you ought to have seen her well and this morning i met this divine countess about nine o'clock on foot in the rue de Gray. oh how my heart beat i began to think that she was coming here said vautrin with a keen look at the student i expect that she was going to call on old gobseck a money-lender 
if ever you explore a parisian woman's heart you will find the money-lender first and the lover afterwards your countess is called anastasie de Restaud, and she lives in the rue du helder the student stared hard at vautrin father goriot raised his head at the words and gave the two speakers a glance so full of intelligence and uneasiness that the lodgers beheld him with astonishment then christophe was too late and she must have gone to him cried goriot with anguish in his voice it is just as i guessed said vautrin leaning over to whisper in madame vauquer's ear goriot went on with his breakfast but seemed unconscious of what he was doing he had never looked more stupid nor more taken up with his own thoughts than he did at that moment who the devil could have told you her name monsieur vautrin asked eugene aha there you are answered vautrin old father goriot there knew it quite well and why should i not know it too monsieur goriot the student cried what is it asked the old man so she was very beautiful was she yesterday night who madame de restaud look at the old wretch said madame vauquer speaking to vautrin how his eyes light up then does he really keep her said mademoiselle michonneau in a whisper to the student oh yes she was tremendously pretty eugene answered father goriot watched him with eager eyes if madame de beauseant had not been there my divine countess would have been the queen of the ball none of the younger men had eyes for any one else i was the twelfth on her list and she danced every quadrille the other women were furious she must have enjoyed herself if ever creature did it is a true saying that there is no more beautiful sight than a frigate in full sail a galloping horse or a woman dancing so the wheel turns said vautrin yesterday night at a duchess's ball this morning in a money-lender's office on the lowest rung of the ladder just like a parisienne if their husbands cannot afford to pay for their frantic extravagance they will sell themselves or if they cannot do that they will tear out their mother's hearts to find something to pay for their splendor they will turn the world upside down just a parisienne through and through father goriot's face which had shone at the student's words like the sun on a bright day clouded over all at once at this cruel speech of vautrin's well said madame vauquer but where is your adventure did you speak to her did you ask her if she wanted to study law she did not see me said eugene but only think of meeting one of the prettiest women in paris in the rue des grès at nine o'clock she could not have reached home after the ball till two o'clock this morning wasn't it queer there's no place like paris for this sort of adventures Tcha! much funnier things than that happen here exclaimed vautrin mademoiselle taillefer had scarcely heeded the talk she was so absorbed by the thought of the new attempt that she was about to make madame couture made a sign that it was time to go upstairs and dress the two ladies went out and father goriot followed their example well did you see said madame vauquer addressing vautrin and the rest of the circle he is ruining himself for those women that is plain nothing will ever make me believe that that beautiful comtesse de restaud is anything to father goriot cried the student well and if you don't broke in vautrin we are not set on convincing you you are too young to know paris thoroughly yet later on you will find out that there are what we call men with a passion mademoiselle michonneau gave vautrin a quick glance at these words they seem to be like the sound of a trumpet to a trooper's horse aha said vautrin stopping in his speech to give her a searching glance so we have had our little experiences have we the old maid lowered her eyes like a nun who sees a statue well he went on when folk of that kind get a notion into their heads they cannot drop it 
they must drink the water from some particular spring it is stagnant as often as not but they will sell their wives and families they will sell their own souls to the devil to get it for some this spring is play or the stock exchange or music or a collection of pictures or insects for others it is some woman who can give them the dainties they like you might offer these last all the women on earth they would turn up their noses they will have the only one who can gratify their passion it often happens that the woman does not care for them at all and treats them cruelly they buy their morsels of satisfaction very dear but no matter the fools are never tired of it they will take their last blanket to the pawnbrokers to give their last five-franc piece to her father Gorio here is one of that sort he is discreet so the countess exploits him just the way of the gay world the poor old fellow thinks of her and of nothing else in all other respects you see he is a stupid animal but get him on that subject and his eyes sparkle like diamonds that secret is not difficult to guess he took some plate himself this morning to the melting-pot and i saw him at daddy gobseck's in the rue des Grès. and now mark what follows he came back here and gave a letter for the comtesse de restaud to that noodle of a christophe who showed us the address there was a receipted bill inside it it is clear that it was an urgent matter if the countess also went herself to the old money-lender father goriot has financed her handsomely there is no need to tack a tail together the thing is self-evident so that shows you sir student that all the time your countess was smiling dancing flirting swaying her peach flower crowned head with her gown gathered into her hand her slippers were pinching her as they say she was thinking of her protested bills or her lover's protested bills you have made me wild to know the truth cried eugene i will go to call on madame de restaud to-morrow yes echoed poiret you must go and call on madame de restaud and perhaps you will find father goriot there who will take payment for the assistance he politely rendered eugene looked disgusted why then this paris of yours is a slough and an uncommonly queer slough too replied vautrin the mud splashes you as you drive through it in your carriage you are a respectable person you go afoot and are splashed you are a scoundrel you are so unlucky as to walk off with something or other belonging to somebody else and they exhibit you as a curiosity in the place du palais de justice you steal a million and you are pointed out in every salon as a model of virtue and you pay thirty millions for the police and the courts of justice for the maintenance of law and order a pretty state of things it is what cried madame vauquer has father goriot really melted down his silver posset dish there were two turtle doves on the lid were there not asked eugene yes that there were then was he fond of it said eugene he cried while he was breaking up the cup and plate i happened to see him by accident it was dear to him as his own life answered the widow there you see how infatuated the old fellow is cried vautrin the woman yonder can coax the soul out of him the student went up to his room vautrin went out and a few minutes later madame couture and victorine drove away in a cab which sylvie had called for them poiret gave his arm to mademoiselle michonneau and they went together to spend the two sunniest hours of the day in the jardin des plantes well those two are as good as married was the portly sylvie's comment they are going out together to-day for the first time they are such a couple of dry sticks that if they happen to strike against each other they will draw sparks like flint and steel keep clear of mademoiselle michonneau's shawl then said madame vauquer laughing it would flare up like tinder End of chapter 4